Welcome to Bridging Voices, uh, the podcast series of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung's Multinational Development Policy Dialogue in Brussels. With the series Bridging Voices, we connect international experts and voices from the global south with decision makers in Europe. My name is Jan Leino, and I'm working as a program manager for foreign and security policy here in Brussels. In today's episode, we're going to talk about Russia's and China's engagement in Central Asia and its implications for Europe. For this discussion, I'm very happy to um, welcome two distinguished guests. Firstly, let me meet, uh, let me greet uh, Alina Belskaya, who's a policy advisor for the EU's uh, Special Representative to Central Asia. Before uh, before joining the Special Representative's office, you work intensively for the European Union as well as for the OSCE in the region as well as in Caucasus. Welcome, nice to have you, Alina. Glad to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Looking forward to our discussions today, Farhad. <laughs> Absolutely. That brings me to the topic. Thank you. Our second guest today, uh, Dr. Farkot Aminunov. Uh, Farkot, you're currently employed by the Said University in the United Arab Emirates as an uh, assistant professor. Before that, you were the deputy director of the Central Asia Institute for Strategic Studies uh, in Almaty, Kazakhstan. You are also the author of our recent CAS study on China's security and military cooperation in Central Asia uh, and Europe, uh, Central Asia and its relevance to Europe. Uh, nice to having you here, Farkot. Thank you very much. Alina, I'll, I'll kick off directly uh, with you. So we're in Brussels, Central Asia is quite far away. Yeah. Um, why should we care about Central Asia? What's what's the uh, unique selling point in Central Asia? Let me start by telling you a sort of fun story um, or a main guidance that we have received from Ursula von der Leyen for our work in Central Asia. Uh, last year in November, EU um, held an EU Central Asia Economic Forum, and Ursula von der Leyen uh, recorded uh, a speech uh, for to open uh, the forum. And she spoke, she spoke, she spoke, and then she at the very end summed up: Central Asia matters. Since then, uh, this uh, motto and this hashtag has been sort of guiding principles uh, for our work. Um, why Central Asia matters, it, um, you know, Central Asia importance has grown for us over the years. Um, and um, with uh, sort of each new strategy that the European Union has adopted towards Central Asia, there are more and more areas of cooperation and more and more areas of mutual uh, benefit uh, for our um, engagement and for our relations. So probably something that everybody uh, thinks about immediately when they think of Central Asia it's, I- is its geostrategic uh, location, a bridge, as we like to say, or crossroads between Europe and Central Asia. I think the other uh, point that p- people think about is uh, its share in EU's energy security uh, and in um, critical raw materials. And of course, the market potential of 70 million people, maybe more now, Farhot. I mean, I think, you know, uh, Central Asia's very young uh, population is its great um, asset. And then, of course, uh, something that has become increasingly important uh, for Europe is um, regional security in Central Asia, especially uh, we see it growing over the past year uh, since Taliban takeover in Afghanistan. Uh, something else, I think, or two other points, which sometimes maybe we forget a little bit, uh, but they are also extremely important, is Central Asian uh, integration into the global uh, system. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, since reform processes started some years ago in, in a number of Central Asian countries, I think there is more interest for Central Asian countries to integrate into multilateral system. And I think it is important for European Union because multilateralism is sort of its vision um, uh, for for the global um, order. And uh, the other thing is uh, European Union's climate agenda. It is very ambitious and uh, it's very important to get Central Asia on board. And uh, also as Central Asia is one of probably one of the most vulnerable regions to climate change, I think it's very important for us that that is addressed properly uh, on the ground. So Alina is um, telling a bit about climate, energy security, regional stability and so on. Farkot, you're from the region. 
Uh, in your recent study, uh, you pointed out that Central Asia has been very important both for Moscow and for Beijing, for Russia and for China. Russia, of course, the five Central Asian republics have uh, been previously part of the Soviet Union. They're also a central part of the Belt and Road Initiative. But yet you pointed out in your study uh, that the old division of labor, if you can call it like that, that uh, Russia is uh, responsible for the uh, security and hard politics in, in Central Asia and, and China bears the main responsibility for economic development, that this is uh, breaking up. Could you please illustrate what you mean with that? The, the starting point where uh, Alina said that Central Asia is important what was kind of, you know, exactly what we needed. Central Asia is important, Central Asia matters, but is Central Asia a priority in the neighboring powers' foreign policy? I would say no. It's not the priority for China, for Russia, for EU, for the United States. It is important, but it's not the priority number one. And that was actually a guiding principle in their foreign policy. So we don't want to be present permanently in all sectors, right? So why not just to divide our sphere of influence and work closely with Central Asian countries within the boundaries which we have set for ourselves as priorities? And it so happened that Russia as the legacy of the Soviet Union, continued being a major political, geopolitical and security actor in Central Asia. And then China, of course, with its growing economy in Central Asia, is a neighboring region, rich for resources, very important for the Chinese connectivity, you know, ambitions. They started channeling huge amount of money to Central Asia and they ended up being an economic power. So what role the European Union was playing? EU has always been playing a very important role of a normative power, promoting democracy, transparency, accountability, kind of you know promoting regional cooperation and trying give, trying to give you know local voices you know uh, uh, um, uh, 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 certain importance. That was a division of labor before, but now this division of labor is fading. We can just look at some of the numbers. Okay, Russia still a very important security guarantor, a political actor. But does it mean that China is not actually stepping into the security and military domain? Unfortunately, not anymore. And as I said, if you look at uh, some of the numbers, now China is the second largest arms sale, you know, a sailing partner to all five Central Asian countries. Uh, um, Ten years ago, the share of the Chinese, you know, uh, kind of uh, in the arms sale with Central Asian states was less than 2%, 1, 1.5. And now it's almost 20%. One-fifth of the arms coming to Central Asia are Chinese. And the military bases, China is building military bases, not all over Central Asia yet, but in the neighboring countries. Tajikistan, for instance, and they want to increase the number of uh, military you know, outposts up to 40 very soon. Uh, uh, these are just a few examples of how China is stepping in into the military and uh, security domain. Can we say that Russia is not part of an economic development in Central Asia and it has nothing to do with it because it's covering security? Absolutely not. Russia is still one of the major economic partners. In fact, second to China for all major economies in Central Asia. The amount of bilateral trade with Kazakhstan, for instance, amounts up to $20 billion, as much as uh, uh, the Chinese you know, uh, share of the trade. So Russia is an important economic power. And the EU, with this new strategy in 2019 and the EU strategic compass, now they are also trying to bring up visibility for themselves. Up until recently, EU has done a lot of things for Central Asia, but most of the projects were very local. They worked with, uh, uh, you know, on the ground with the people. Now they want to enhance their visibility. Doing this without engaging in broader economic relationships and stepping into security would be impossible. So. I would like to still uh, focus a little bit on the security aspect here. Um, Alina, I'll give you the word. You have a question. I just wanted to add, actually, <coughs> European Union is the biggest development donor. Oh yeah, yeah. In uh, Central Asia, it's uh, with over one billion mm -hmm. over the past ten years. So yeah, mm -hmm. I'll go to the development aspects uh, a little bit later. I would I still like to talk with you um, about the security aspects a little bit. Focus on that as as we also have uh, published recently a study on that. So um, in 
put it put it directly in in, in Europe we hear that Russia is interested in building uh, its own empire it, it talks about spheres of uh, influences um, we have a, a war going on to, uh, at the moment in Ukraine we also know that uh, Xi Jinping and uh, Vladimir Putin are connected well with each other what you just told me that gives me the idea that then Russia is apparently with China willing to share its sphere of influence in Central Asia. Is, it, is this a correct interpretation of what you just talked about? Oh, well, I think so. If you are referring to those regional mechanisms, mechanisms which are in place, Russia-led Collective Treaty Security Organization and China-led Shanghai Cooperation Organization. If you are referring to those, then absolutely yes, and I'll explain why and how. So uh, um, at the very beginning, in the 1990s, when the Collective Treaty Security Organization was established, uh, some expert claimed that this is some sort of a counterbalancing to NATO, right? Of course, the resources that uh, CSTO has is in no match with what NATO possesses, right? But in Central Asia, CSTO has been a very important actor and quite influential. So Russia acts with Central Asian countries using this regional framework. Right? And even the January events in Kazakhstan has clearly shown that while Central Asian leaders are requesting certain assistance, military and security assistance from Russia, they would also like to engage within the framework of the CSTO. Why? That would actually minimize all the speculations and debates and talks about Russian intervention into domestic affairs of individual Central Asian countries. So very convenient platform, sort of you know, a mechanism for two countries to engage. Shanghai Cooperation Organization is different, right? It's younger, uh, it has different dimensions, including economic cooperation and partly security. And when it started, it started with three isms, right? Fighting against terrorism, uh, extremism, you know, separatism. And the whole idea was that China wants to protect itself from those isms coming from Central Asia and Afghanistan. And this Rhetoric, this logic still kind of, you know, remains within this organization. And that's why uh, China decided not to engage sort of openly supporting the Kazakh leadership even in the recent events, right? No Chinese assets, no Chinese citizens, no Chinese investment were, were under direct threat. Mm -hmm. So they said, it's not, it's not our place to intervene. But whenever the Chinese interests are under threat, then China has a number of uh, other mechanisms develop which, which the country developed through bilateral you know, relationships, uh, private security companies, military bases, you know, uh, uh, um, and, and China is more than willing to use them to protect it. So yeah, um, competition, cooperation between those two regional you know, mechanisms it isn't clear because two countries, they have different way of engaging in security and military with the region. Um, Alina, that brings me to a question to, to you also related to security. You mentioned earlier that uh, Europe is, uh, is interested in, in stability in the region. We talked about um, here with Farkot that uh, many of the countries in the region are member of the Russian-led CSTO. Uh, many of them, uh, most of them are member of the um, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is uh, a Chinese-led uh, security forum at least, um, how does European Union want to then promote this regional um, aspect and through which organization does it uh, do it? Keeping in mind that the OSCE also is, Russia is a member currently there, so what, what kind of a platforms do you s foresee uh, might be winning here for the European uh, engagement? Well, we cooperate very closely with the UN and the OSCE uh, on uh, many aspects uh, of uh, our uh, work and engagement with Central Asia. So I think I would see these two as the most important uh, partners uh, for European Union. Okay. And just to add, I'm also familiar with a number of foundations, right, the third parties, which are supporting Central Asian countries. Uh, invest kind of, you know, this uh, grants and trainings and, um, you know, educational programs, uh, even you know, some tangible things happening on the ground when those foundations are helping local business, small and medium-sized businesses, rural population, the most vulnerable people, someone living in the mountains or in the desert area which lack access to fresh water and some other basic human needs. Those organizations are also very active. I'm pretty sure they have their own scheme on how to engage and 
uh, where to invest, how to work, but uh, foundations are also very, very active. You, you already went into the uh, development uh, sphere. I would like to stay there as well. Uh, and go, I'll go back to you, um, uh, Alina. As you know, the European Union has um, mm-hmm. announced an, a global infrastructure or connectivity initiative called Global Ga- Gateway, uh, around 300 billion euros. Um, this has been leveraged now uh, recently also within the G7 as a 700, I think 700 billion uh, euros initiative from the G7, of which 300 uh, would be coming from the European Union. Yet uh, you quoted uh, Ursula von der Leyen. I have a quote as well from Ursula von der Leyen uh, regarding Global Gateway. Uh, it does not make sense for Europe to build a perfect road between a Chinese-owned copper mine and a Chinese-owned harbor. How do you see this uh, engagement in an area which is already uh, very much focus of the other global actors we talked about? I, mean, I think a global gateway is a connectivity strategy um, above all. I mean, infrastructure is part of it. And um, I think... Uh, Like you correctly pointed out, I think it will be impossible or very difficult for the European Union to compete in hard infrastructure in Central Asia, and there is no need for EU to do that. I think EU needs to look at uh, areas where it can contribute most, uh, where it has um, a a cutting edge uh, in in what it is doing. Uh, I think there are many uh, ways how... EU can support a global gateway uh, in Central Asia, how it can support connectivity. Um, I think something that comes most uh, to mind and something with which Farhod actually started at the beginning is EU as a normative power. It sounds very academic. Um, <laughs> in the EU slang, we would say maybe EU as a regulatory uh, actor. But basically what it means, uh, you know, to put it... Uh, in simple words, is I think EU has a lot of um, best practices. Mm -hmm. It has uh, good legal frameworks uh, for sustainable development, uh, for protection of customers, for um, many things which are important for building a better future. Effectively, I would say, you know, the vision of the European Union is building a better future for its citizens, and for all these years, EU has been building this. EU has been also building different um, connectivity models internally, um, which I think could be explored for for the uh, region. Uh, The other thing which is quite important also is people-to-people connectivity. When you have education, I think this is where European Union actually stands a very good chance. both, uh, I mean, also in um, uh, vocational training, uh, in uh, in general, in supporting education, um, and uh, also in um, maybe green. I mean, we call it now a green transition, but basically supporting digitalization and supporting uh, the nexus of uh, water, energy, and climate. Mm-hmm. I think this is the way EU has uh, uh, comparative. Not o- actually, not only comparative advantage, but cutting edge with technology, with regulation, with policies, with working with communities. Uh, so I think this is um, where we are best placed. Mm-hmm. I, I, I like to take I like to take that up, but Farkod, I see you, you want to respond as well. Uh, mm-hmm. Maybe uh, t- there is a guiding question. You both mentioned people to people connectivity. You both spoke about the normative power. So normative power is built on the reception of the people who are there. So people, you, you need to have a, a validity of people of interest and, and wanting to change, wanting to move, wanting to build better. So we talk in, in, in Europe a lot about this information and, and, and believing Russian propaganda, for example, in, in the case of Ukraine. Farkot, my question to you, how do Central Asian people, generally speaking, react to all of this? Are they very pro-European? Are they very pro-Russian friendly? Do they understand the Chinese narrative, if you want to uh, call it like that? Can you give us an, an overview of how the Central Asian people are like? Oh, that's a good question and a very difficult one. We call this region Central Asia, but again, it's like, you know, five different Central Asian countries, and if you break them down into kind of, you know, disintegrated more or less regions inside Central Asia, then you get a lot of different, you know, points of references. 
and they have their own priorities and they have their own perceived you know uh, uh, um, kind of approach and attitude towards external actors I, I I have to admit that the European Union and the West in general is quite popular among the you know uh, young generation who somehow directly or indirectly was part of the international setting you know studied abroad work with the foreigners yes they know what the european union or the west can offer uh, to the region and they try to kind of you know use this very effectively but for those who who have never been abroad then russia still remains a very important actor and of course we cannot ignore a, a labor mig- migration factor in here when you know large number of people they migrate to Russia for work and then come back and of course this russian influence is heavy on them in their mindset those regions especially in kyrgyzstan and tajikistan which are very close to china right so there mm-hmm. they have their own special attitude towards chi the chinese influence paradoxically the closer you are to china the more negative you are about chinese presence the further you are from china the more positive you can look at the chinese presence and that's why if you look at the surveys conducted of uh, Kazakhs and Kyrgyz they quite negative perceive Chinese presence in the region but Uzbeks I don't think there was like survey conducted with Turkmens but Uzbeks and Tajiks they are more kind of pro Chinese M- maybe just to uh, once still clarify um ho- looking at we we read news for example Russian TV channels have been blocked now from the European Union So when Central Asians, I understand there are different countries there, and, and I understand people who went to Europe or they, they work maybe in Russia, millions of Central Asians work in Russia, as we, as, as we know. What kind of a news channels do they watch? Do they watch local news channels, local newspapers? Do they read the Russian news? Uh, maybe you can give us an overview on that. Well, what's, the, what's the landscape? Well, like? mostly from my personal experience, as I have noticed and observed, mostly Russian TV, right? So, and mm-hmm. even the local TV you know channels they are somehow aligned with the china uh, with the russian news whatever is being uh, broadcasted in the russian tv channel then somehow is being translated into the local tv channel so basically when it comes to foreign policy foreign pol- geopolitics you get the same news right it's just uh, differently translated and kind of you know delivered to the people So it's Russian for the most part, and only those who are familiar and actively use social media, right? Let's say Facebook, LinkedIn, you know, are on YouTube most of the time, and whatever happens on the global scale, they start, you know, googling and looking at the situation from different sources. Then they have a different opinion. Other than that, it's mostly very much pro-Russian, I think. That's a, that's, a, that's very interesting. Uh, I, 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 we can go back to this, uh, Alina, unless you want to comment. So then I would go to the next. Uh, would go to the next uh, ne- topic because we've touched upon it. Both of you have touched upon it. Geopolitics, uh, and, and and I think Farakot, you also mentioned it. And you do a lot of study on energy security. Uh, so I would like to touch upon that topic a little bit. Um, Uh, as you know, the European Union um, has uh, a new strategy which basically says that in two years or three years' time we should be uh, independent on energy imports from Russia, meaning fossil fuels, mostly oil and gas. Now, if I put it bluntly, uh, it, from the European point of view, it might seem that you look at the world map and you see where is oil and gas, and then you see, okay, Russia is, we don't want to buy there anymore, so we buy from other regions. So... I guess Central Asian oil fields are not empty currently and waiting for investments and, and, and people to come there. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit. How does the situation look like uh, in light of the view that, of course, Europe at the moment is looking for other suppliers for Russia? Oh, that's an excellent question. If you are you know, asking whether Central Asia can become an alternative to Europe, you know, to replace Russian oil and gas, the answer is no, right away. Uh, almost 30% of the European oil come from, comes from Russia. And uh, what is it? 36 less than 40 percent of the european gas comes from russia and these are millions of barrels of oil, billion like millions of barrels of oil and uh, uh hundreds of billions of cubic meters of gas like, uh, um, i don't remember the exact number but i think in 2020 it was like almost 180 billion cubic meters of gas just channeled from russia to the european countries what can central asia offer there is only one project if we are talking about gas, and it's called Trans-Caspian Pipeline, right, to link Turkmen natural gas 
you know, uh, um, to then Azerbaijan and go through Caucasus to some of the European countries, and then it just kind of, you know, being channeled through two different, uh, uh, you know, pipelines. What's the capacity of this pipeline? It's 30 billion cubic meters. Imagine if they build it next year and it starts operating in full, still it's going to be less than one-fifth of what uh, what's Russia is exporting to the European Union. So numbers don't add up right in here. And also, uh, for Russia, as I said, Central Asia is not the priority. Europe is the priority number one in its foreign policy. And Russia has always been blocking all pipeline projects which... Uh, uh, were promoted by the Europeans and uh, very well, you know, received by the Central Asian countries, but they were by bypassing Russian territories. So Russia was against it, and Russia sometimes used very hard, you know, approach to it, like initiating conflict in the Caucasus, so that those pipeline projects would never be realized. Who would invest in the region where the conflict is going? Of course, no one. The Europeans said it several times: money is not an issue. And this Transcaspian pipeline is just 180 miles. So it is feasible, it can be built in no time, but the political constraint is there, right? And that's, uh, that's a really big issue up until recently. Everyone was surprised when the Chinese actually built their natural gas pipeline from Central Asia to China. And if you add all the four networks now, it's the longest in the world, right? Why? Again, because for Russia, Europe as the customer is important. As long as this gas goes somewhere else, but not to Europe, Russia can accept this. But the moment this gas kind of, you know, starts moving towards the European direction, then there would be some reaction. It doesn't mean that we should give it up, right? Yes, it is important for both Europe and Russia. Europe cannot replace Russian gas but with Central Asia. But that's going to be a huge addition, kind of, you know, contribution, especially to the eastern part of the country, uh, of the European Union. Yes, definitely work on this direction, but expect some sort of a reaction from the Russian side, and we all should be willing and prepared to sacrifice something if we want this to get, uh, you know, done. Just to summarize, it, it, it paints me a relatively bleak picture. You mentioned that this has been 30 years in the, in the building. It's not been made yet, but still the Chinese have managed to do the same thing. In just in, in a couple of years, not just 30. Right? So okay. Just in a couple of years, they, they first signed an agreement in 2006. They start building the first line of the Central Asia China gas pipeline in 2008. Uh, and it was completed the same year, 2009, the second line, 2015, the third line, and now 55 billion cubic meters of gas can capacity, infrastructure-wise, okay. linking Central Asia to China. It was amazing. Now, now, I, now I have to go back to uh, now I have to go back to Alina and ask. Uh, 30 years we have not, not uh, been able to do a, a pipeline. Maybe we will not in this situation build it in the next two years either. Uh, are there any low-hanging fruits in Central Asia where the European Union could help also, like Farquhar, uh, I understand, I understand, Farquhar said, that there's uh, some leverage what the Central Asians would like to build up against their bigger neighbors. Are there any low-hanging fruits where the European Union should now engage in order to gain leverage and, and influence in the region? I, I think, uh, you know, over the years... Um you can see how uh, the relationship with Central Asia uh, has uh, developed, uh, expanding uh, different areas of uh, cooperation. Um, Low-hanging fruit? I am not sure there is a such thing, but I think uh, what we have developed with Central Asia is um, uh, um, sort of a framework of cooperation from political cooperation uh, from to trade uh, to um, programmatic uh, work and um, I think what we need, we need to sort of look for uh, where we can make uh, the most um, impact and I think where we can um, help uh, most um, the Central Asian uh, populations, and I think and, uh, we work quite a lot on environmental issues, uh, you know, saving the RLC, which is, mm -hmm. is this the probably the world's worst environmental disaster? Right. I don't, yeah, probably, yeah. or at least, yeah. at yeah. least yeah. they are very pretty much uh, mm -hmm. at the top. We're trying to work on uh, water management uh, issues, which I 
would like to see gain more importance in, uh, you know, on the agenda of Central Asian um, leaders. I mean, while I think at least what we hear that there is enough water in the region, however, it needs to be managed much better. Um, education, definitely healthcare. I think there are many trade uh, promoting intra-regional trade. I think there are um, a lot of uh, issues we can work on. Uh, what I sometimes wonder, and I would like sort of to hear um, uh, your opinion, Farhod, is, you know, where does European Union matter for um, Central Asia? You know, where, in what areas do you think Central Asian leaders should put cooperation with the EU at the top of their agenda? I'll do it. Uh, I'll let you, Farhod, of course, answer. I, I'll formulate it another way. You are now a European Union decision maker from the 300 billion euros uh, which is going into the global gateway. You can now freely pick 1 billion to invest in Central Asia uh, to promote the values that Alina is just talking about. Where does it go? Thank you very much. Excellent questions, both of you. Uh, before I answer, I, I, I want to give you the story, which I really, really like. Um, so there was a storm, right, uh, um, in the sea. And then after the storm, one young girl, she was actually walking down the beach. And then she was collecting the fish and throwing it back into the sea. But the, uh, there's like millions of fish in, uh, on the beach. And then one man approached the girl and asked, uh, what are you doing? What, uh, what's the point? You cannot save them all. And she said, it, there is a point for those fish I save. Right? And I think the European Union contribution to Central Asian region is enormous. Right? It may not be visible, you know, uh, always, but whatever they are doing, people know that. I was part of the expedition from, uh, from the mountains to the Aral Sea. So we drove across those distant territories and the regions. And in some of the villages up there in the mountains, you could see like a village for 45, 47 people. And some of them, they had, uh, you know, solar rooftop panels, you know, installed, which provided them with electricity and perhaps some sort of heating. And when I asked, they said that was a German foundation, that was kind of European Union, that was the OEC engagement in there, right? So people know for them it matters and it's very important. And I was also thinking about when Alina mentioned that, you know, there are some areas where China and Russia are very active. So for European Union, it would be very difficult to compete. Definitely. Infrastructure, road infrastructure could be one of this. But everyone is looking at the road infrastructure as a huge project, right? So kind of trans-regional trans, uh, roads or even inside the country, but hundreds of kilometers long. Yes, China is the one building those roads. However, smaller roads connecting villages to this main road are still in a terrible condition, right? And for people, it is important if those roads, smaller ones, linking their, their homes to the main infrastructure from which they can benefit, you know, uh, 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 is priority. And who is going to deal with this? Of course, that's the responsibility of the local government, but they don't always have either resources or the will to do this. Russians, Chinese will do that? Definitely not. So perhaps European Union was, is, with its local but integrated approach in the region could be of utmost important, importance. Um, another issue kind of, you know, this is something that helps the region, helps the people, and trust me, people in Central Asia, they know this. They appreciate it very much. Uh, if European Union wants to enhance its visibility, there is no other choice but to engage in the similar projects as the Russians and Chinese do, right? Many say that the EU or the West is losing this competition. It's not losing. It, it is there, but it's present in different sectors which are less visible. So you want to be more visible? Security, military, defense, or even large infrastructure is something that you have to be part of. It doesn't mean that you're going to replace Chinese investment or the Russian, uh, you know, money being channeled to the region, but you're going to be part of this kind of more regional dynamics. And in my personal opinion, if I had this 1 billion uh, US dollars, going back to your question, since I work on energy, that's going to be definitely energy sector. Energy sector, but, uh, you know, disintegrated, autonomous um, energy system to be installed. I would really love to see this in Central Asia, like the European countries have right now, right? Because all this 
um, solar power plants and the windmills being installed in the country, they're all linked to the central grid. And they're being built by, let's say, Chinese or there are Russian investment in the oil and gas. But to what extent it really contributes to the energy security of the people who are the most in need of this? I'm not sure about that. But if the European Union can cha- channel this money to build autonomous, disintegrated systems for a particular small population centers um, throughout the region, then I'm pretty sure it's going to be a huge contribution to the local development. To summarize in one sentence, the European Union should invest in the energy to secure, according to you, into the energy security of the five Central Asian countries, and also simultaneously gain on its own energy security. All right, <laughs> perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Alina and Farkot, for this discussion today. I think we could uh, go on for a long time. Uh, unfortunately, time is limited. Thank you for turning into uh, Reaching Voices podcast series. Dear listeners, please follow us on social media and visit our webpage for our latest publications. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.